Welcome to our first workshop of four on adulting, which is the art of successfully moving off campus, budgeting, and being a good neighbor. We have Dr. John Lowney, our Executive Director of Housing and Residence Life here to speak to you all. We have Mr. Dion Harris from Berkeley Communities Apartment Complexes to speak to you all about leases and how they work, the ins and outs and the things, top things to know. And then we also have financial aid, Mr. Travis Bouchard. He'll be here shortly to speak to you all about financial aid and how that works with potential off-campus leases and apartments. Okay. So magnificent Monday, everyone. <clears throat> Some of you may be, by a show of hands, how many people are a little anxious about not being able to submit a housing contract and all the things that go into our off-campus living, right? So hopefully with this workshop, you'll be able to have a clearer understanding and be able to take a deep breath and a sigh of relief by the things that we will, um, we will kind of go through. We're gonna take you through all things off-campus living um, so that you gain an understanding of what that entails and the different aspects re about regarding off-campus living, develop a knowledge of specific priorities, certainly um, budget, money management, and planning, financial aid. Mr. Richard will talk a little bit about how every student is packaged for financial aid. One of the things that each of you has in your packets um, is a financial breakdown. And one of the things that we'll do is we'll go through that specifically so that, and I'll figure out where you're living um, to tell you what your budget is so that you are staying within budget. Every student is packaged for financial aid in such a way um, that housing is a part of that package. Um, we will develop an understanding of leases and their function. Mr. Harris will take you through what is a conventional lease versus a student lease or by the bed lease as they're referred to. In addition, um, you'll find out what to look for and what to be on the lookout for when searching for apartments. And then we'll take you through tenant rights and responsibilities and what to expect um, when moving into your new apartment. Um, you'll be able to develop skills to be a good neighbor and hopefully develop some good skills on living with people, being an apartment mate to someone who you are in an apartment with. So um, very, very clearly, um, we've got a host of things um, to do. So by a show of hands, how many people already live in our apartments? Where do you live? Sebastian. So if you live in a place, um, village, um, or courtyard? Place. So I need you to take this number down. $8,206.80. Divide that by 12. Yeah. $8,206.80. So that's your, that's what you, that's your maximum budget per month on a 12 month lease. How many of you live in residence halls? Raise your hands. All right. So where do you live? Where, where do you live? You live in Van Story. So take this number down, take Um, four thousand four hundred nine dollars down, and then take at four thousand four hundred nine dollars plus five thousand dollars because that's twenty five hundred dollars a semester for your meal plan. And what's that number? Anyone who lives in a traditional hall, how many other people live in traditional halls? Take that number down and. $4,409 and add another 5,000 because it's $2,500 a semester for your meal plan. And divide that by 12 and that's your number. Anybody living in Barbie? So Barbie is $4,609 plus another $5,000, 2,500. Cooper? No Cooper. Uh, Curtis, 
You and Cooper? Huh? Aggie Point, yes. Aggie Point is um, $7,743. $7,743.75. Anybody else that I didn't call? Yes. Huh? Yes. So villages, and you're in a regular double? Double deluxe. $6,066. That's another $5,000 for a meal plan. Where else? Morrow. Morrow is $4,609. Collegiate Commons. Um, Collegiate Commons is $8,206.80. Haley is four thousand. You live in a um, four thousand six hundred nine dollars, plus another five thousand dollars for meal plan. Add that up, and, and whatever you have. Anyone else who I did not get? Yes, Sweets E. You're in a regular double. Five thousand nine hundred and forty-three dollars. You mean Aggie Sweets? Okay, so $6,578 plus another $5,000 for $6,578. For the folks that just came in, where do you live? Um, Richmond. So if you live in Richmond, you live in a, a regular dog. Single, single $6,216 plus another $5,000 for meal plan. You're going to add that up and divide it by 12. Van Story, you live in a double or a single. $4,409 plus another $5,000 for meal plan. Yes. Huh? You live in a single or a double? $6,000. $578 plus another $5,000. You take whatever number you have and you divide that by 12 and that will give you what your budget is. Mr. Harris will talk to you about when you're in, budgeting is really important. You wanna be making sure that you spend less than your budget for housing. You want, to be made, you want to ensure that when you are thinking about off-campus living, you carve out money on what you would normally spend on food. As students, I know that you all are eating DoorDash. I know that you are going out to eat. I know that you're chilling with friends. I know that you're having kickbacks, all of these other things. I need to caution you that when you're thinking about, if you're looking at a traditional lease, a traditional lease, you're going to need a co-signer. And sometimes with student housing, you may need a co-signer as well. Traditional lease is 12 months. Most student apartment leases are either 10 or 12 months. And Mr. Harris will cover those things as well. But you want to start thinking, if you're spending whatever amount, that dollar amount is to reside on campus, I want you to think about coming in under budget to reside off campus. Does that make sense? So in each of your packets, is a budget worksheet so you can track what you would spe be spending on personal hygiene products, transportation, gas. The other thing to think about when you're moving off campus is think about if you, how many people have cars by show of hands? Cool. How many people don't? For those of us, for those of you that don't have cars, thinking about renting out a complex that already has a shuttle service or that is right across that is located to a heat bus. The heat is the higher education area transportation system. Hypothetically, if you lived at the district, the district, is, you cross the street and the street that you would cross is friendly and friendly, but the heat bus stops right across the street from the district um, and that sort of thing. So think about where you're going to live. Um, and then you want to save for emergencies. One of the things that we've changed at North Carolina a and if you receive a refund from financial aid or from scholarships, that re refunds are now distributed the Friday before classes begin. 
so that you can take, before you move into any complex, you're going to have to pay whatever deposit and probably your first month's rent before they're going to have you move in. Once you get your refund, that is not you hitting the lottery. You don't want you to go out and buy 50 essentials, hoodies, or other items, or get a bus down, or whatever students are spending money on. We want you to be able to pay your rent for the semester and that sort of thing. So think about um, income or saving to the best of your ability. Um, think about what you need rather than what you want. And certainly set up an automatic savings um, so that you can really navigate the process of successfully moving off campus. Location, location, location. Where you're going to live is really important. Very clearly, we have established for you an off-campus housing website just for North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University students. It's offcampushousing.ncat.edu. You can, if you log on to our housing page, the housing, excuse me, the off-campus housing, the off-campus housing marketplace is there, and that, and then. Those are some places that are there. When we have the housing fairs, those are going to be places. Again, you want to think about when it's rainy, when it's a little cooler, when you don't feel like going to class. You need to think about who you are as a student and living in a place that's going to help you to be the very best student that you can be. Does that make sense? Okay. The other thing is um, to think about plan for expenses. If you are living in a student complex, it's usually all fees included. Um, sometimes there may be some fees that are not included. If they pick up, if you have concierge trash service, you're paying for that. That means that if they come pick up your trash, usually Sunday through Thursday, you're paying for that. So think about that. Um, think about um, is there on-site maintenance? Is there on-call maintenance in apartment complexes? Is it pet friendly and are there fees? One of the things that I need students to know and understand, let's say you bring a pet and you don't register that pet. Apartment complexes do health and safety inspections all the time. I don't want you to run into a bill at the end of your lease, like, oh my God, what happened for you having a pet, an unauthorized pet in an apartment? Um, you know, is landscaping included? In most places it will be. Are utilities included? You don't want to be in a situation where you have to pay utilities and you get behind on those particular things. Um, one of the things, some complexes will allow you to do an installment plan versus monthly rent. One of the things that we strongly encourage you to do is pay your rent at the beginning of the semester so you don't have to get to midterms or finals and then worry about trying to be evicted from a particular place for non-payment of rent. The thing I need each of you to know is when you are talking about an individual lease, that is a legally binding contract. Here at the university, if you tell us, hey, I've got some things going on, I'm moving out. We're like, okay, cool. We'll give, we'll give you a proration if you, let's say, if you moved out today, we will prorate, give you a refund based on the number of days left in the semester. When you are in an apartment community, you have to either pay that money or find someone to sublease your apartment. They are not going to let you out of the lease. If you, we don't want anyone to pass away. If you passed away, they would let you out of a lease. So it's a little bit different in terms of housing complexes. A lot, as you go to off-campus housing fairs, they're gonna offer you gift cards, they're gonna offer you different incentives. While that's nice, I don't want you to be fooled by that. I need you to really use your judgment and don't sign anything until you have a firm grasp of where it is that you're going and that kind of thing and what is included in that particular process. Research and look at different properties. Very, very clearly, there are some properties that we do not have on our website that are local to us who will remain nameless where our students have been harmed. As a parent, as an administrator, 
any property that a student has been injured or harmed at will not appear on our website because we care about you as students and we want you to win and we want you to be successful. And we want your parents to know, hopefully, that their, that their student is in a safe place. So, of course, slow down and don't be in a hurry to sign a lease. Now is the time where most complexes are starting to do leases for the upcoming academic year. It is early in the season. You are not late. You are on time. You're actually early. Make sure your apartment um, is moving ready and know the difference. So a few years ago, we did a master lease at an apartment complex who will remain nameless. This apartment complex used to be managed by a company that we trust, and then they were no longer managed by the company that we trust. So I went out to the property and I walked some spaces had done a master lease for our students and there was dishwashers that had rancid water in it. There were stoves, it, there were apartments that were completely unlivable. When you go to an apartment complex, they will most likely show you a model room, a model apartment. Those model apartments are gonna look different from what you're getting. Those model apartments have been tricked out by interior decorators. And most of the time, they don't look like college student apartments. Um, they, they, they're, they're nice, but I need you to be, I need you to know and understand, once you move off campus, I need you to look at um, and inspect and take pictures of when you move in so that you can document exactly what you found. Anytime you are communicating with a property, you need to do so in writing, not in talking, not in having conversations, but in writing. Um, certainly know the safety of the apartment and the area of safety stats. So one of the things I need you to ask questions about, even from students who live there, I know that many of you use side chat. Um, I certainly look at side chat often because that's where students communicate freely. Ask around, hey, is this a cool, safe place to live? Is this some place that you would like to live? And no one's gonna tell you any, any more forthright or honestly than another student and that sort of thing. So be mindful of that. And then what does it mean to sign a lease? A lease is a legally binding contract. Yes, we have an ironclad housing contract, but because we're the university, we certainly will work with you. Apartment complexes are private businesses that just don't let students out of out of how out of legally binding lease agreements. A traditional lease is usually going to be 12 months. A by the bed lease or leases are either 10 to 12 months. Um, Mr. Harris will get into more of the specifics of those particular leases. And let me stop and let me introduce Mr. Dion Harris, and he'll talk to you a bit more about leases. But if you have questions, we have time for questions. So no worries, we'll get to them. Okay, Mr. Harris. From Berkeley Communities. Hey, good evening, everybody. Um, so I know we've already given a lot of information. I know it's like, wow, we're about to start getting an apartment. But just take a deep breath. Um, I did this already. I graduated from AT and 10 years ago, but I went through the same process of trying to find an apartment, um, not having the house and things like that. Uh, but I just want to let you know that the property managers in the area, they're here to help. Um, so just definitely do your research, like Dr. Lowney has stated. Go around. Um, don't just look at what's online. I know a lot. I know we as a generation, we just want to look online. We want to do everything online. We want to look at the pictures online. But definitely go and look at the leasing offices. Look at the models. Um, some places may not have models right now because they're all leased up. Um, because, of course, a &T, we are accepting so many people. But please just go look at what you're leasing at. Um, go and drive around the property during the day. Make sure, maybe drive around it at nighttime. Make sure, like, the lights 
are bright. Make sure you can feel yourself, uh, you know, living in that community before you sign the lease. Um, as Dr. Nani stated, my name is Dion Harris. Um, I'm the Director of Learning and Development, and I'm an Area Manager for Berkeley Communities. Um, we do manage quite a few properties um, in the Greensboro area. Um, so we manage um, a lot of student housing. Um, they have availability. We're leasing now, so definitely we'll, we can talk uh, afterwards. Um, finding off-campus housing. These are just some tips that you want to keep in mind when you're looking for a home. Uh, we kind of already talked about the location. Um, want to make sure that if you don't have a car, that it's in walking distance. If you have a bike, if it's on the bus line, things like that. Um, I didn't have a car my first year. Um, they couldn't stop me from not going to class, so I had to go to class with an umbrella or going in wet and things like that. Uh, so you want to make sure that you're at least close to campus. Um, once you definitely move off campus, uh, you, you'll have the opportunity to at least bring your car and things like that to get you back and forth uh, onto campus. Um, but if you don't have a car, you want to look at the information or look at that distance driving back and forth to campus. Um, we talked about the cost. Uh, Dr. Nani did a great job just kind of going over how much your budget would be. Um, and what he stated was that will be like your monthly cost. Like this is what you can kind of afford in a monthly rent. Um, so you want to look at that when you're going in, when you're going to the apartment and you're saying, well, how much is a one bedroom? How much is a two bedroom or things like that? Just notice that when, when they give you that rate, that's per bed. So that'll be you paying that amount, your roommate, Paying that amount if you're going into a two bedroom, if you're going into a three or a four bedroom, it'll be you and each person in their part, each person in their apartment paying that amount. So it's not some people would say, Oh, it's 770. Okay, well, that's 77 divided by two, and then y'all can say, Okay, well, we're all paying like 300 and some dollars a piece. No, it's not like that. We lease by the big hit with student housing. Um, so each person will have their individual lease and each person is responsible for paying that amount um, per month. Everybody get me, everybody follow me on that one. That's a good thing. That means if you pay your rent and your friend doesn't pay their rent, that means we don't, we're not asking you for, to help your friend come up with their rent. We're going to, we're going to be talking to your friend to pay that rent portion, okay? Um, and then also, if you if you don't have you know a roommate in mind, a lot of companies they have things called roommate matching, to which we will ask you a series of questions. Um, some people do this with a like a system. You'll get a link, you ask questions, and they can automatically roommate match you. You'll get a invite, and you say, okay, well, based on your answers, we think that this person will be like a roommate match with you. Then it'll send out a link, and y'all can kind of connect, and then. Like a certain amount of time to get back with people. Say, yeah, we, make, we, we think that we'll be able to make match. All right. Um, you want to look and see what type of residential style that you're getting a house, a condo, an apartment, things like that. Believe it or not, Grace Girls kind of stepping it up. So we have, you know, regular apartments. Some apartments have upstairs, downstairs. Some have townhomes. Some, I mean, we have everything kind of in Greensboro. So you just want to take a look around and look at what uh, Greensboro has to offer. Um, so you just want to look at that and see. I mean, some of the more fancy do cost a little bit more. So again, you also you always want to make sure you're staying within your budget. Um, furnished or unfurnished. I know that's important because um, especially if you stay on campus, you know, you already have all of that furniture already. Most student housing still comes with fully furnished units. But some do not. So you just want to ask that question. Um, does this apartment come fully furnished? And fully furnished is just a bed, nightstand, a desk, a dresser, things like that. Um, it may not come to living room furniture or it may come to living room furniture. So you just want to ask that question. All the appliances, of course, are included. But you just want to ask, what does your fully furnished consist of? Um, number of occupants, I already went over that. Just depends on what size apartment you want. If you know that you don't want a room with three other people, then I wouldn't suggest you saying that I want a four bedroom um, because then they're going to try to place you with three other roommates. Now, usually the higher the uh, occupant of the, uh, the higher the occupancy, the lower the rent. So if you want to go with a four bedroom, usually your four bedroom is a little bit less expensive than your threes and your twos and your ones are most expensive because you're paying for that privacy, you know, just like in, on campus, you know, 
you're just paying for that. Um, this is a good one. I'm glad to see this on here, accessibility. If you do have a disability, um, you just want to make sure that what you are going into will address your needs, um, especially on the first floor, things like that. You want to make sure that those doors are wide in bathrooms and things uh, that are ADA applying. Um, timing, are you interested in a short-term, monthly, or long-term yearly lease? Most student housing are either 10 months or 12 month leases. Um, and it's honestly, it's a business thing. It's, we, it's a business that we have to run as well. Um, so our leases will start in August and then they'll usually end in May or July of the next year. Or um, if you want to pay a little bit extra, say you are a senior, you graduate in December, some communities have short-term leases that end in December of that year, um, but it is at a premium. Um, and you have to be like one of the first ones to, to lease there. And we usually are at a cap with how many we can get for that. Amenities, this is a big one because I know a lot of people look at that um, and say, okay, well, I want the swimming pool. I want the workout center. I want like the things that attract people to come to that community. So just ask the questions. That's why I say, please go and look at the apartment communities. Um, don't just look at the pictures because again, like Dr. Nani stated, like we want to make everything look good on the website and then your model apartment. But just show up. I mean, and then if you like it, and of course, you'll be like, okay, I can see myself staying here. Um, and pet friendliness. Um, pet friendly is a big thing. Um, you just want to make sure if you have a pet, if you're bringing a pet, um, then that community accepts pets one. Um, now, once we get into emotional support animals and things like that, it's something totally different. But if you want to make sure that community accepts pets, if they do, it's a pet fee involved. Um, you have to pay that pet fee. You don't want to bring a pet on campus I mean, to the apartment community and that, and then you're, and it's like illegal because they will charge you. Um, and I mean, it's, it's usually hefty fines and it's not that the communities are trying to get over on the students, but we have to stay firm. So, you know, student resident don't bring the pets and, you know, things like that. Are there any questions so far about what I went over so far? All right. Rights of a North Carolina tenant and landlord. Um, these are just duties of the tenant. So these are just your duties. Like when you sign your lease agreement, Again, we've already stated that this is a legal, this is a legal and binding document that you guys are signing with the landlord. So, like Dr. Nani stated, if you say, "Hey, I gotta go home," or "I've gotten in trouble," or "I gotta go," you still signed a legal binding lease. So, I want to make that clear that we'll do whatever we can to try to find someone to take over your lease agreement, but we just. We just won't say, okay, well, go ahead and pack up and leave. You know, we have to do what we have to do as far as of the business that we have. Um, so you want to read your lease thoroughly and completely. A lot of people, I was, I was one of them when I first, I was just so excited to sign my lease that I just signed my lease. Um, so you want to read your lease. I know it's a lot. It's, it's definitely electronically now, so you can just when you. Once you get your lease, but you finally realize that you're going to uh, lease at this particular apartment, just read your lease. Um, don't just read the first page. Definitely want to read it all. Just pay particularly uh, attention to the first page that has your first, I mean, your start date, your window, the amount that you're going to be paying, your security deposit. All of that good stuff is usually on the first page. You want to pay particularly important, I mean, importance to that first page of your lease agreement. Um, and if something is not right, do not sign the lease agreement. I want to say that again. Do not sign your lease agreement. Call them back and say, this is not what we talked about. You know, if anything is not correct, don't sign it. Have them resign you another. I mean, have them resend you another lease agreement. Don't let them talk you into saying, just sign it and we'll fix it on the back end or we'll have you, uh, we'll fix it on your moving day. No, like we've already said, if it's not in writing, then it didn't happen. So you definitely want to make sure that everything is correct before you put your signature on anything. And again, it's just to hold them accountable, hold us accountable, and it holds you accountable to whatever you're agreeing to. Um, keep your apartment in clean and safe condition. Um, once you move into their apartment, 
you're agreeing that you're going to lease it up, that you're leasing the apartment, that you're going to keep it in clean condition. Um, you know, like we, we get people that, you know, just keep stuff crazy, um, bugs and stuff like that. So we just want to make sure that once you move to your apartment, you're going to keep it in good condition. You're going to make sure that you're keeping it in a habitable condition. When people come in, you're going to have roommates. So you just want to make sure that you are living um, like real adults. Um, I'm going to comply with any and all community rules. You will also receive this when you move in. You're going to receive your community rules. You're going to receive everything that help you out throughout the year. You're going to receive at move-in day or you receive before move-in day. So you're just going to receive it. You just have to follow it. If you have questions about it, just talk to your landlord uh, and kind of go from there. Notify the landlord of any work order issue. This is important. We don't come into your apartment unless we have to or unless we're doing walks. So if something is going on in your apartment. If there, if you notice like a leak going on in your apartment, if your smoke detector is beeping, if you notice that your carpet is wet, if you notice that something is going on in your apartment, you have to let us know so we can fix it. Um, and you also just have to let us know like at a reasonable time. So when people, residents kind of wait until five o'clock on a Friday about saying, okay, well, this is leaking in my apartment, but it's been leaking all week. We still, we need to know at a reasonable time so we can make sure we get it done. We're going to still get it done, but you know, you have a duty to say, Hey, this is going on in my apartment. And then we have a duty to actually fix what's going on in the apartment. Um, and then you're also responsible for any damages imposed if you did the damages. Um, when you move in, you're going to get a moving condition checklist. So your moving condition checklist, you just be extra, like be extra on your moving condition checklist. If there's a dent in the wall, if there's a, a little small hole in the wall or from somebody maybe um, hanging a picture up, you want to list everything on your moving condition checklist. Um, I would say you shouldn't turn in a, a blank moving in checklist. If you notice anything, even if you think it's not that big of a deal, list everything on your moving condition checklist. Because what that, what that what we do is we put it in your file, and then once you move out, we when we're doing our final walk, we have your moving condition checklist with us. So we can't say that oh well this dent was in the wall and we're going to charge this resident because this dent was in the wall. If we have it on the moving condition checklist, it only covers you. All right. Uh, any questions so far? Okay. Um, the renter's guide is really, it just really talks about the rights and responsibilities. Um, and it kind of goes over, um, and it's in your handout, but it kind of goes over like what are considered emergencies, what do we do? Um, as far as the rights and responsibilities of landlords and tenants. Um, so you want to pay particularly close attention to that. Excuse me. Um, so when you're signing your lease agreement, it's pretty much stating that we can't just raise your rates out of nowhere. You signed your lease, so your, your rate is going to stay the same throughout the duration of your lease term. Um, it goes over um, us stating as far as what is expected in your apartment, like the running water, um, heat, when the certain temperature is uh, below a certain degree or air when the uh, temperature is above a certain degree, things of that nature. And that talks about the responsibility of you guys about paying your rent on time so you don't get a late fee. Um, Dr. Nani talked about if you have that large pump sum and financial aid giving you your um, refund check the Friday before school starts, go ahead and pay your rent. Um, most um, apartment communities will not allow you to move in without your security deposit and without your first month's rent. Um, we usually will wait for like the second month's rent and third month's rent because we know that uh, financial aid hasn't hit yet. Um, but now that we know we will, we probably will probably change that. But you probably still should go ahead and pay your rent before uh, before school starts. I know we don't have a lot of information, but any questions so far? Oh, I think that's my slides. Well, again, I'm Dion. Uh, if you guys have any questions, I'll be here a little bit afterwards. I have my card for anyone that may want to reach out. Um, and good luck with finding uh, housing for you. Thank you. So next up, we have a real rock star. We have Mr. Travis Richard, who is the 
um, executive director of financial aid. Um, he'll spend some time going over those things. Something to consider. You do not need an apartment that is $2,800 a month with travertine countertops. Um, if you don't even know what travertine is, there'll come a time in life when that may be your preference. But as a student, I don't think you need that. Um, and the other thing I want to think, want you to think about is I want you to caution yourself. If an apartment is two hundred dollars, that that would be a red flag. Um, if it's too good to be true, then it's too good to be true. Um, so think about that. But I want to turn it over to my phenomenal colleague, Mr. Richard. Hi. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Travis. Oh, the mic is on. Got you. Sorry for that. Thank you. My name is Travis Richard, and I serve as the Executive Director of Student Financial Aid and Scholarships here at North Carolina a and State University. I, um, I'll be looking down. I wanted to make some notes on my phone so I can make sure that I capture all of the most important information that I feel you need to know regarding your financial aid and off-campus living status. So just by a show of hands, how many students have completed the 24-25 student financial aid FAFSA if by high hands? All righty, so that's not enough hands for me to see. So um, one thing that I do need you to do if you have not done so already, you do need to complete your 24 to 25 FAFSA online now. For those who have completed the FAFSA, you are aware that there are delays with the FAFSA right now and no fault of the university, really no fault of the Department of Education as well. This is a new FAFSA process. If you are a returning student and you completed this year's FAFSA and last year's FAFSA, you probably noticed that there was some difference in the questions. There's a difference in the layout of the FAFSA. So for those of you who have not done so already, there were some students who were having challenges and parents as well. You do not want to be one of those students who have a challenge with your FAFSA and you waited until August to complete your FAFSA. Um, in the new current FAFSA model, the university cannot assist you with errors on your FAFSA. So like how now on your current FAFSA, when you have a challenge, universities can log into our administrative portal. We can see where you are in the process and we can identify any challenges that you may have and we can help you rectify those challenges. In a new FAFSA model, we are unable to see where you are in the process until your FAFSA has been completed. So I do strongly encourage you to go ahead and complete that 24 or 25 FAFSA if you haven't done so already. How many students are aware that you can use financial aid to stay off campus by high hands for me? Good, so not, a, not enough hands, but that's what I'm here for. So you can use your financial aid to stay off campus. Financial aid is designed for students living expenses, whether it's on or off campus. So for example, our students who live off campus, typically those students will receive the same dollar amount to stay on campus. They would just be paying for their on-campus housing. So students do not receive a, a different type of financial aid. There's no um, specific or uh, certain things um, that's called an, an off-campus financial aid package or financial aid designed just for off-campus students you would receive the same financial aid on campus that you would use for your off-campus housing. So as the gentleman was sharing previously, it is important to note that if you receive that refund check at the beginning of the school semester, to so go ahead and pay that full term semesters of rent as if you would have done if you were staying on campus. The types of financial aid that can be applied to a student's account, again, will be the same as your on-campus financial aid package that includes your Pell Grant, any other type of state grants that you may receive, your subsidized, unsubsidized loan if you choose to accept your student loans, and of course, your um, any departmental scholarships or your merit athletic scholarships, those two can be applied to your off-campus living as well. When we award students financial aid, how many students who you currently live on campus, you see that we award you for the fall semester as one term and we award you for the spring semester as a separate term. And you have two different disbursements, right? You get your fall refund check typically in August or September, and you get your spring refund check generally in January and February. Well, that won't change when you move off campus. You will still get your refund check in August if you live off campus, and you will still get your refund check in January if you live off campus. Again, as the gentleman shared before, 
we, uh, we try to give students their refund checks within the first week of school because we do recognize that we have a large um, population of students who stay off campus. Whether you live off campus by yourself or you live off campus with staying at home with your parents, you may have dependents. We realize that you need those funds to take care of other um, additional bills or things to help you attend college. So I try to get those funds to you as soon as possible. But it is important that you, one, complete your FAFSA. And if you have any missing type of documentation, let's say you have not completed your entrance counseling or your master promissory note because you've accepted your student loans, you haven't submitted your tax documents that we need for verification. Hi, hands for me. How many students have ever been selected for verification and you've had to turn in any additional information to our office? Hi, hands for me, right? Those documents would delay the process, and he's shaking his head in the back back here, right? Those documents would stop your financial aid from being processed on your account. So just as much as we recognize you need those funds, we need you all to recognize that we need you to turn in everything that you need to our office to finalize your financial aid package and get your funds to you in a timely manner. Until we have everything that we need, we cannot release those funds to your account, right? These are federal and state guidelines. So we do get students come to our office and it will show us sometime, unfortunately, the link with landlord letters and we really, really want to help them. But the federal government says that I cannot release any Title IV federal aid to your account until you have satisfied all of the requirements that they deem to be um, as acceptable and completed. So again, if you are missing any documents on your financial aid portal, your student portal, please get those documents to us as soon as possible. Let me. I spoke a little bit about refund checks. Again, generally, we try to get students their refund checks within the first week of school. Um, I am aware some universities give refund checks before school. We are not one of those institutions who release refunds before the start of school, but they generally will release the first week of school. For all students who are returning student loan borrowers, and I'm going to share something about a first time loan borrower in a second. If you have received student loans in the past, you will generally get your refund check the second week of school. So refund checks will always go out process the first week of classes. And by the second week of classes that we have parents in the audience, I do want to make you aware your student will have their refund check the second week of school, provided they submitted everything to our office. All of the funds have been applied to their account prior to the university running refund checks on a weekly basis. At the start of the semester, all students will have their refund check by the second week of school. Now, if a student is I am sorry, um, Siri decides to want to type my entire presentation on my phone now. If a student is a returning student um, and a student is a first time loan borrowing student, how many people remember completing, if you've accepted student loans, how many of you remember completing a master promissory note and an entrance counseling? High hands for me. If you've, if you've accepted a student loan before and you received a refund check off of a student loan, you would have had to fill out a master promissory note and then entrance counseling. You do that every 10 years. So some of you may not remember if you're in your junior and senior year, like myself, I didn't remember by the senior year when I was doing exit counseling and they said I borrowed X amount of money and I say, no way. I borrowed this over four years and they showed me the documentation and I did. Well, if you haven't received a student loan before, there is a 30 day delay in you receiving your first loan disbursement, regardless of your classification. So let's say, for example, you are a junior, you've never received a student loan before, you've always either paid out of pocket, let's say you probably was receiving a baseball scholarship, you're no longer on a baseball team anymore, and you, um, you're going to accept that student loan for the first time. You will not receive your first disbursement until 30 days from the start of classes. So for every first time freshman, and I'm sure we don't have any first time freshmen in here, the freshmen get the same, um, the same note as well. For all first time freshmen, and you all were first time freshmen at once as well, they do not receive their first loan disbursement until September 15th of the fall semester and until about March, uh, February 20th of the spring semester. So, and I'm sharing that information because if you are a first time loan borrower for whatever reason, and you are staying in an off-campus apartment, 
and your rent is due in August and it's due again in September, it is extremely important that you communicate with your um, with the uh, complex where you live in and explain to them that this is my disbursement dates. Your disbursement dates are in your offer letter with your student identification number on it, so it can be tied back to that particular student. But again, if you are receiving student loans for the first time, there is a 30-day delay with you receiving your um, your student um, first disbursement and your refund check. Paying your student rent. Again, communicate with your complex. I, too, was a student at Southern University in Baton Rouge many, many, many years ago. I know it may not look like it, but it was a very long time ago. I graduated undergrad in 2008. And I too lived off campus. I um, mean, it was a bit challenging for me because I was so used to living off campus, living on campus, but it was a part of the Adalton and I knew it was something at some point it was gonna happen. And um, they, I, they could not stress enough that once I received that refund check, please pay your rent. I cannot express that enough. And parents, we have some parents in the audience. This is a um, transparent moment. I've been in situations before as a student with friends and as an administrator at um, a few different universities where the students will get the refund check and they will not pay the rent. And then they will tell the tenants and the parents, well, I didn't get my refund check. Well, it can be tracked and traced, right? So we have documentation that we indeed <laughs> gave you your refund check. Please pay your rent when you get your refund check. If you get that, that $5,000 lump sum in the second week of school, if you owe your apartment complex $3,800, pay the $3,800 that you owe the apartment complex, and the rest is yours. If you're enrolled in summer, you are eligible for summer financial aid as well. And I mentioned summer because generally a student will sign a 12 month lease that may begin in August or July and it will run through the next cycle at the beginning of the fall semester. They will start, begin to renew their lease sometime in May or June for the upcoming semester. Generally students are not enrolled in summer school. If you are not enrolled in summer school, you are not eligible for a financial aid for the month of June and July which means that you are responsible for the payment out of pocket for your rent for the months of June and July. So generally what students will do, they will work for the summer and pay their rent, or sometimes what they may do is save their refund checks or the excess of from the fall and the spring to help pay for their summer, um, finding their summer rent. But just giving you a heads up, if you are not enrolled this summer, we cannot give you any financial aid to assist you with your rent over the summer semesters nor can you borrow from the fall semester to pay for your summer rent as well. I see one of the parents, she's laughing in the audience. I just wanna give you all of the FAQs and some things that we hear, and it sounds logical, right? I'm coming back to a and in the fall semester. Of course, I should be able to borrow from the fall semester to pay for my summer rent. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. So we, um, you, you would have to pay out of pocket for the summer semester if you're not enrolled for the summer semester. And those, those are actually all the questions, all of the statements and comments that I have regarding financial aid. Most importantly, I'm here to let you know that we are here to help you. I see when I mentioned FAFSA, a couple of hands went up. Not certain if there were any questions regarding FAFSA, but the university, we are expected to be in process in FAFSA by April 15th. So by April 15th, students will be made aware of what their financial aid packages look like. Now, for the students who have not completed the FAFSA, what that means is that that takes you out of the running for free grant aid, free scholarship aid, because generally those funds go to students who complete their FAFSA by a certain deadline. The quality deadline for the university is March 1st. That's in your student portal and it's on the website as well. And where we are past the date of March 1st, right? It's not to say that you will not receive any grants or scholarships. It's to say that students who completed their financial aid by March 1st have a higher chance at receiving some of those funds. So again, if you have not completed your FAFSA, I strongly encourage you to complete your FAFSA. This is an unusual time right now in the financial aid world with the FAFSA being delayed, with us not being able to send packages out until almost May. In a normal time frame, students would have had their FAFSAs, their financial aid packages last month in February. So we are appreciative of the Department of Education for making the FAFSA more simpler for you and your parents and for universities. This new model will allow
allow for students to be eligible for more federal financial aid. It's just that for this first time around, there is a delay in the FAFSA. So I apologize if it's holding up. You, I'm applying for a different scholarships. Most of the organizations have reached out to universities across the country. They too have delayed their deadlines to realign with FAFSA deadlines as well. If you have not gone out to the scholarship portal for additional financial aid, the scholarship portal has uh, many resources on there for you to apply for. You have to read. We are college students. I have to be honest with you. We have to read the scholarship material. You have to apply for them. They're not going to just give you $5,000, right? You have to write the essays. You have to read over your essays. We do have a scholarship department that assists with helping write scholarship letters. If you need any assistance, please see us in the Dowdy Building in Room 101. If you have not applied for any third book Marshall scholarships, how many third book Marshall, Marshall recipients do we have in the room? If we have any, your third book Marshall recipient. So he's a third book Marshall recipient, and they get pretty good funds, right? They get pretty good funds. So if you haven't applied for any third book Marshall scholarships, I do encourage you to do that as well. The same with your departmental scholarships, the same with UNCF scholarships as well. Uh, we understand um, resources are limited. They are extremely competitive. Um, at North Carolina ENT, you all, you all are amongst uh, the top and brightest black and brown students in this country, right? So you are all competing with high GPAs for the same scholarship. So make sure when you're applying for the scholarship that you are writing a scholarship letter that makes you stand out from the next student. Um, do I have time for any questions? Because he has a question. Okay. That's a good question. And I'll repeat the question so everyone can hear me, hear the question. The question is, Thurgood Marshall, they have what they call a mid-year review. And they review your grades, make sure that you're still enrolled, check your cost of attendance and things of this sort before they can release funds to your account. And sometimes Thurgood Marshall, the payments for the student's account can sometimes be um, rather delayed because some of the processes are manual processes between universities and between Thurgood Marshall. In an example where you are receiving a Thurgood Marshall scholarship, not an outside scholarship, but Thurgood Marshall, if you're receiving a Thurgood Marshall scholarship, a BP scholarship, a Shell scholarship, a scholarship that, that the university has a partnership with, my office will write you a letter to your landlord on the letterhead from us, and we communicate to the landlord on your behalf, letting them know how much we are waiting for and what your refund check will be. If you're receiving any outside scholarships that you apply for and you are responsible for the follow-up on that scholarship, let's say it was John Baptist First Church, and they're giving you $10,000. The $10,000 scholarship is really, really nice. And I, I'm really appreciative that they're offering you that scholarship, but you are responsible to follow up with John Baptist Church to see when they are gonna release those funds to the university. So it's good that they gave you a scholarship paper and it says Travis Richard's gonna get $10,000, but the university will not apply $10,000 nor release $10,000 to your account until John Baptist Church, they provided the funds to the universities. And we do run into issues sometimes where students have multiple outside scholarships. And unfortunately, they are unaware when the, the, um, or the organizations are going to send those funds and those payments to the university. So when you're applying for these outside scholarships, you really want to ask the donor, when are you going to send those payments to the university? The university cannot provide me with the refund check until you provide them with the funds to give me the refund check. All right. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. That is correct. So the question is, if there are any errors on the FAFSA, when can you make the corrections? So much as I've shared before, if you are aware, in a normal FAFSA time, if you would have made an error on your FAFSA, within two to three business days, you could have logged in and you could have made the update yourself. Well, now, if you made any error on your FAFSA, 
you have to wait until after April 1st before you can go back in and make any edits to your FAFSA. Now, if you have to make any edits to your FAFSA and you've completed the FAFSA prior to March 1st, you still fall into the bucket of a prior to March 1st party deadline student. So I don't want you to be alarmed if you completed the FAFSA on February 23rd and you realize it was incorrect you go back in in May 15th and you make the correction, you still fall into a February 22nd pot of an early action student for FAFSA purposes. All right, any other questions? And lastly, I just thought about something. Lastly, um, parents, you too can still apply for Parent PLUS loans if you haven't done so. We don't encourage um, students or parents borrowing more than what the students need. But again, students and parents, you are eligible to apply for Parent PLUS loans. And those funds too can be used to go towards the students off campus living. And again, the university does not send funds directly to the complex for any student. The funds go directly to the student if it's a student refund check or if it's a parent plus loan and the refund check is generated from a parent plus, it goes directly to the parent and either and the parent or student are responsible to make that payment directly to that complex. All right, any other questions for me? Well, thank you all so much. I'm sure you're going to enjoy living and adulting off campus. Um, you all be safe. And as always, if you need anything, we're located in a Dowdy building, room 101. So one of the things, please give a round of applause for Mr. Richard. One of the things I think that's important um, that I didn't say at the beginning is Moving off campus provides you with an opportunity to develop, to develop a skill set that you will need. When you graduate college, most people don't buy new homes. Most people will rent apartments. So you're getting experience on how to do that. This process is not designed to take you out. It's a process designed to help further develop you. And if you all have questions, uh, we are delighted to answer any questions that you may have. Um, it's interesting that very few people have asked questions. Um, I didn't see a lot of hands go up with the, for the Thurgood Marshall Scholarship money funds that are available. You are leaving free money on the table. My financial, my financial outlook is you never leave money on the table. And if you have not applied, I would certainly tell you to certainly think about that. Think about certainly who you're going to live with, to chill with, to kick back with, is different from living with. And as the executive director of housing, roommate, apartment rate, apartment mate relationships are all good until they're not. They're all good until somebody's sneaky link is living there 24 hours a day. It's all good until one roommate decides that they're gonna lay hands on the other person not in a spiritual way, but in a physically aggressive way. Um, it's all good until you start to discover that maybe I'm cool with you, but living with you is something different. So think about and make a real solid decisions about who you're going to live with. Because once you move off campus in a separate apartment complex, you're not going to be able to just say, I want a room change. It's not the same thing. So let me stop because we've gone over a lot of information in your packets. There's a wealth of information. Take your time, read it, review it. If you have questions, we are willing to certainly meet with you to go through some things so that you fully understand. Are there questions? Yes. Oh, no, maybe that wasn't a hand. Okay. Not a question. Yes. Mm -hmm. So one of the things, the question is, when do you think is the best time to apply for an apartment? Before you assign a lease, we want you to take your time and review that and read that thoroughly. You're ahead of the game because this is at the beginning of the leasing season. Many complexes have not already, you know, some complexes have started, but you there's a lot of housing stock out there. 
Location, 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 as we discussed in the beginning, you want to make sure that it is a safe location. You want to make sure you know that you get reviews from other students who live there. And we want to encourage you to come to our off-campus housing fair. We have three of them. And that information will be sent in or is included in the packets if you signed in through the QR code as well. Um, so it's early in the season and we want you to make the best possible decision. Um, and again, you, the budget, if you look at the rate sheet, we gave a rate sheet for everybody. You would take whatever, wherever you're living. And if you're living on campus, meal plans are about $2,500 a semester. Add five, that's 5,000 in the academic year. And you wanna add that to any building that you're staying in and divide that either by 10 months or 12 months. 10 months will give you what you can afford maximum and you want to be underneath your maximum. You want to budget accordingly. We want everyone to act your wage. And your wage will be what you can really afford so that you're spending less money to live off campus than you would to spend on campus. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yes. So if so, basically, wherever you're going to live, many student apartment complexes are either ten or twelve months. Correct, Diana? Mainly, mainly twelve. Okay, there are some that are that are ten, um, but you want to ask that question, and then that's where you want to take your budget, what you're paying now, and you want to see what you can afford. You do not do that math in front of the people. Um, that's a private thing. Um, and you want to make sure you're underneath your budget, acting your wage, and that sort of thing. So does that answer your question? Yes. Yes. Is there another question? Was this helpful? Okay. Breathe and know and understand we have your back and we want you to win and we want you to be successful. If you think of other things, feel free to stop by our office. We're located in the Aggie Village 2. Village, uh, Aggie Village 2, room 204. That's where our main housing office is located. Thank you all so much for coming out to one of four adulting, successfully moving off campus, budgeting, and being a good neighbor workshops. We thank you. We appreciate you. And have a wonderful evening. And we'll be around if some of you want to stick around for questions as well. Have a good night.